thank you guys for coming tonight. Um, we're really excited to be hosting uh, Mari Nakano. Um, she's the up here, I can read it off. Uh, <laughs> you guys can read it too. The <laughs> Deputy Director of Design and Product for the Mayor's Office of Economic Opportunity. Um, and uh, she was formerly at UNICEF. And uh, we invited Mari because a lot of the students in our program are very interested in service design and how design can be used for a tool for social good. And so we're very excited to hear about um, Mari's experience in this area and, and learn about how we as designers designers can approach this field and this work. And without further ado, um, can we give a warm welcome for Mari Nakano. Hi everyone, it's a real pleasure to um, be here this evening. My name is Mari Nakano. Um, I currently serve as the Deputy Director of the Service Design Studio for the New York City um, Mayor's Office of Opportunity. Um, we literally just launched the studio on Friday, so I will do my best to describe. Um, a little bit about what we're doing there. Um, I'm only about a month and a half into that job, but previously, actually when I was talking to Amy um, and the IXD program, uh, I was still employed with UNICEF at the time, so I'm gonna do a little, I'm gonna try to do a little bit of a hybrid of like talking a little bit about my experience at UNICEF, um, as well as talking about my experience my, my very brief experience thus far, but fresh and awesome experience thus far with, um, uh, with the mayor's office. Um, but first I thought maybe, you know, I was like, who the heck knows me? Like, I, you know, I don't know anybody that knows much about me and I wanted to kind of just give you a little bit about me. Um, I, I just, at first I just kind of wanted to like do a little bit of what my daily fuel is. I just kind of feel like with all the things going on these days, you know, problems that are happening in the world, leaders that are not doing a good job, you know, what I need the most to kind of get me through my day are a lot of humor and, well, a lot of coffee sometimes too. Um, but I just wanted you to get to know me a little bit through some series of text messages and <laughs> screenshots of my phones, both old and new. Uh, this is sort of the way I try to or deal with my day a lot. Uh, so you can see um, this is kind of how I try to get up in the morning. Um, I cross some <laughs> bad words out um, to motivate me, but I also you know, am a mother of a four-year-old, and so there's a lot of times at night where I come home after work and I need to put her to bed, but I still need to get up after to do the bills or to finish a presentation for work and stuff like that. So these are the ways I kind of try to encourage myself to get through my day. This is, can you, this is circa 2012 interface, I think. Um, but this is a conversation between me and my husband. <laughs> I'll let you kind of read it uh, um, yourself, but this was actually, um, a text message flow after um, during Hurricane Sandy. He was away like in Ohio. He's a musician and was at a gig somewhere. And so I'm just texting him, joking around that like I'm getting my apocalypse bag ready. And he's the supportive husband he is was like, don't forget your crossbow. And then um, so this is the kind of conversation I have in my life with my, you know, with my partner. But, you know, it also manifests in my family. Um, so uh, when I was at UNICEF, I worked um, a lot around um, the uh, around the old Ebola outbreak, and so I was talking to my mother and brother about it. And this is sort of the conversation that happened between them, where my mom's telling me she's sick, and then my brother, who's a physician assistant, is like, "Maybe you have Ebola." <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and my mom's really funny about, you know, oh well, you know, I'm not ready for Buddha yet. I don't think, and he's like, okay. But this is just sort of the way, like that, these are the people in my life that kind of really help get me through my day, that keep things light and funny, um, especially in the work that I do. Um, and I just, you know, for me, it's a lot about, I, I design a lot, I, I know I, I'm, I'm committed to, to designing for social impact, for social justice, that's where I come from. Um, that's why I'm a designer, Design. that's my medium, and so um, 
it's a, it's a rough place to be sometimes emotionally, especially when you're a designer and you're very empathetic and, and super sensitive. And so humor and, and coffee really helped me get through my day. I tried to do a little bit of like a, a, a bit of like an about me, you know, from the day I was born to today. And I realized there's a lot of through lines in my life. You know, I played basketball from third grade to the age of 27, like ser very seriously um, with both, you know, high school and Japanese league. And I, I also j went to UCLA, one of the most amazing schools for basketball and, you know, played intramurals there and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I also, during all that time in my teens and early 20s was not a designer. Um, I actually first started off as um, a person that was in social services who cared about youth and did a lot of youth services coordination, uh, both um, in San Francisco where I grew up and also in Los Angeles, um, mostly for the Japanese American community there. Um, but one of my main kind of uh, roles as a youth service coordinator for a com an organization called Little Tokyo Service Center Community Development Corporation was to um, coordinate basketball tournaments for kids, um, uh, like street basketball tournaments annually for about 200 plus kids in the community. Um, and so my, my basketball career kind of came into that because I would coach and event coordinate, um, but you know, also just my love for like teaching and working with children manifested a lot. Um, and during all that time, I was very active in the Asian American and the Asian immigrant community. And so through UCLA and just like my angry Asian 20s, I, I was really part of that kind of space. Um, and arts was actually naturally a part of it. And I think many of you know that, you know, with poetry and, you know, art, any type of art, there's a lot of activism and just naturally embedded with that and the storytelling within that. I went to Cuba, I have a really amazing, supportive mom who's like, if you meet her, you would never think this, but she's one of those people that would say to me, you do what you love and I support anything you do. And if you get arrested for anything that you believe in, I'm there for you I, I, and I support you and I'll help you get, bail you out, you know, that kind of thing. But during all that, all that time, I think one of the things that may have resonated the most was my time working with children. And um, those kids that I worked with in, in Los Angeles, they would often come to me after school or on Saturdays and say, Mari, like, I, I, don't, I wanna know more about photography. I wanna know how to get a job or what to wear for, for an interview. I, I really wanna like, work with a muralist, that kind of stuff. And, they would constantly say that because they didn't have that kind of affordance in their school system. And that drove me actually to decide one day that I wanna to go to art school. And that I wanna to go to art school because I'd like to learn how to teach art. And the funny thing about that was when I did go to art school, um, there were just times where I would say, when people, would, when professors and stuff would ask me like, what would you, what do you want to do with what you are learning here? Do you want to be a car designer? Do you want to be like making, you know, designing beautiful s magazines and all that kind of stuff? And I was like, no, I, I really want to be a teacher. And I really want to like go back to the, the you know, I, I'm inspired by these youth I used to work with and, and those are the people that I want to, that's why I'm here so I can learn those skills from you guys so I can bring that back to them. And so, but I got laughed at a little bit. Um, and that was pretty disheartening, but I kind of fought on. And I think one of the things is, um, you know, I was in a great supportive um, graduate program, the media design program at Art Center, but the social impact track had not started at the time. Um, I'm, I'm 37, I'm, I'm a little bit old. Uh, <laughs> but um, at the time that I was graduating, they didn't have a social impact track. They didn't have a DSI like you guys do. So I'm very envious that you guys have those programs and that you guys have those affordances and you know, to really like be able to like help you build your careers. Um, all that really manifested into me really trying to find my way in my career. And you know, long story short, I ended up at UNICEF for about four and a half years 
and I became the design lead for the Office of Innovation there and helped build a team of, des of designers there. Um, and today, a month and a half in, I'm now um, the deputy director of the New York Mayor's Office of Economic Opportunity. And so my point is your life is in process all the time and sometimes you don't even know it. My job title generally has been design lead, but you know, at UNICEF, for example, we toyed with a visual strategy lead, an interaction and design lead, an interaction lead, no, interaction and design lead, design and interaction lead. And all of that was because we had an audience, a, a non-governmental audience or a, an audience that didn't understand design that needed to understand our value. And when you would say design, as you know, there's this misnomer that, oh, design, you can make me my pamphlet. You can make me like my pretty business card. And so we were experimenting with, could we change the, the title of your career to kind of help make you more important, more valuable. But at the end of the day, after my time there and a lot of reflection, I realized that I'm a design lead at the end of the day and that I'm a designer. And that I think that's something I want to share with all of you is that design and being a designer is something you should hold on very tightly to. We're in a time and age where people are asking you to create a product or create a method and, and, and let that sort of, you know, um, get sucked into the business world or get, you know, pulled into another term that's no longer design, that can wash away that word. But I think it's very important to always really hold on tight to that, to understand that your value is extremely strong and that you need to continue to say that you're a designer and that your value is just as important as anybody else out there in the, you know, trying to do good work. For me, I wasn't born a designer. I didn't grow up and say, mommy, when I grow up, I want to be a designer. For me, for me, I think I realized growing up, um, and as you saw in that crazy map of my life, that design is my medium. And it's for, my goal is about building consciousness. It's about building justice and equity. And so every job I choose to do right now is because the baseline is because it's mission driven, because it's because the work at the end of the day is for saving children. It's for bringing equity to New York, to New Yorkers, um, fighting poverty, you know, all that kind of stuff. That is what fuels me. And if you ask me today, right now, would I take like some million dollar job in some private agency to do some kind of corrupt design work, I would say, no, it doesn't matter. Like I, I would never do that. Um, and, and, and that's something I tr really try to hold true to. And I think that my life really reflects that growing up as a Japanese American who has family that was incarcerated during World War II um, and who's been really active in like working with underserved youth and families and who really cares deeply about Asian immigrant, Asian American population and, the, and our rights clicking together that passion that I really feel like has been part of me for such a long time in my life with my love for design has made the most sense for me. Today, I think I was gonna talk a lot about more like how I've worked on building teams and how I look at teams as like the interface. Uh, we talk, we, there's a lot about building product and all that stuff, but I think that when you have a really strong team, then you can build strong products and strong outputs and strong solutions. And when, your and when your team is weak, a lot of times at the end of the day, the product also is weak too. This is some random sketch that I had about just, I, I, I was thinking about a lot of the team members that I've worked with in my past and, and the way they think, the way they work. And so each of those lines sort of depicts how I see them moving and how I see them thinking. And some are very linear and some are way more chaotic than others. And some are like a little bit slower, but, but they're just as intelligent and they do all have an end goal that they are aiming for. Um, so I just want to give you a couple of examples of like how I've worked with teams. One is the easiest in, I think, is a product. So here's an example of a design of a product that's scaling really rapidly at UNICEF right now. 
UReport is a free social messaging tool um, which enables communication between young people and decision makers. Um, it's, it, it works over SMS on even a really basic dumb phone um, like a Nokia and it's also available on social media channels like Facebook Messenger and Twitter. Um, it's live in over 33 or thir maybe more countries by now, I'm not sure. Um, and it's actually now nearly at 4 million users. The thing about that, it's like it went from 11 countries in 2015, so it got deployed in 11 countries around 2015. But because of, and you know, part of it is because of the way that we deployed the brand and, you know, the communication side of it. Um, now it's at 33 today, so that's pretty quick. And we also have a really, dis we have a quite distributed team where the U Report lead, for example, is in Bangkok and the designers are in New York and all that stuff. And so how we coordinate all that and be able to deploy something like this, which you can actually deploy like within two days if you need to during an emergency is, is something that, um, you know, the design team really worked on. Um, and so when you have a, dis a product that scales that quickly, you have to think about a brand that, you, that can keep up and uh, keep up with the scaling of that and the demand of that. So we actually work with um, a company called VeryNice.co. I think maybe some of you have heard of them before. They do actually a 50-50 like pro bono type of uh, model. Um, but they helped us build a scalable brand a few years back. This is sort of an example of someone in the field who's using one of our worksheets to really kind of pick and look at like where other U reports have been deployed, what kind of color system do they want to apply to their country. So um, a country office may work with a youth group, for example, to help them decide what that voice is for that particular country and what kind of language will this be in. Um, and so they'll quickly kind of fill this out, either analog like that or digitally send it back to us. We will design all the brand collateral for it, send it over to a um, developer in Brazil who will then put it all together into a website and you know, get this thing deployed on mobile and on web uh, within a matter of days if necessary. But as you can see, some of the turnout is our flyers and communication pieces like this that we can turn over within, I don't know, Tushar, you can answer, what, t 10 minutes, how, how long, 15 minutes, you can put stuff like this out for a country office and send it over. This isn't all the U report countries, but one of our goals was um, to really keep a through line through the brand. So you can see how, um, how it's like hard rock cafe style. Um, it's getting to a point where um, we need to start re-looking at it, but we, di we, we got to this place and we got to it quickly. And so you can see some of the ways that the brand has been used on the ground. Um, some things we support the country office with, like the flyers, like some of the social media and the website and things like that. But then from there, we let the country offices take those assets and build um, the communication pieces that they need to get other youth to join. Um, some uh, you report what's really important about a product like this is that it's not just like a text messaging system where you talk to kids. It's something that will help people identify things like Ebola in their neighborhood, uh, if there's stockouts you know, in their classes, um, if, if, are there enough pencils in a school, um, is there a banana plague, can you, help me, can you help me identify what a leaf might look like and can I text that back to you, yes, I'm finding that my dad's plantation has this problem with their leaf, um, please send somebody over to deal with that because bananas are a huge foundational income driver and you know food source for my family and my community that kind of thing so that was a product i'm gonna go into a person so this guy this guy's name is mike <laughs> he's a full stack developer who doesn't sleep much who talks in code and i like totally don't understand what he says most of the time and when he's not dancing at night he's trying to save the world through code about a year ago, he wanted to prototype how blockchain could be used for a humanitarian response. And so he came up to me and he was like talking in his like developer speak. And I'm like, I, I don't understand what you're talking about and how this thing, this hash and this thing does this thing. 
And like, how is that, how, you need to, if you want the right people to understand what you're trying to do, we need to work together for you to explain that more clearly. So I sat with him for maybe like three different two hour sessions for him to like translate himself. And then I like drew this crazy sketch. I'm like, is it like this? Is it like just super, super fast? He's like, yeah, 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 yeah. And then I said, what's your goal? He's like, I, I want to create, I want to create this app. I want to show this app that this like prototype app of how we might be able to, you know, use blockchain to possibly like get a, get a person like, per, like a refugee perhaps to be able to show that they, you know, their identity and be able to cross safely across a border, you know, and show a border patrol or some type of, you know, a verifying authority that, that who they are, you know, especially when you think of a, a situation like Syria or something where people are on rafts and they lose all their papers and they can't prove who they are, they can't prove who their families are, what kind of education they've had, you know, th those credentials, when you don't have that, could blockchain be a solution? And so we were able to tweet that out. So some of the things that, by working together with someone like him, we were able to prototype what, you know, and, and tweet this kind of sketch out um, to a bunch of Bitcoin experts who, who actually saw this, came over and hung out with us and gave us more information about how blockchain might be valuable to UNICEF work. And then, which also then led to actually us having um, a meeting with an assistant to the Secretary General, which is very difficult to have, to explain the potentialities of using blockchain in a humanitarian setting. And the biggest win was that Mike now is like an amazing articulate human being who can talk about his work and not just about blockchain, but like actually if you go to his medium, which is at Mike Fabricant, he has some really great articles about open data and mapping, which you should check out. And so those types of things are how like how like design and designers have been able to influence other individuals in a team. I'm sorry for all the UNICEF people that are here that are on the innovation team, but one of the big things, and to some people, this is like office layout, like design and office layout, okay, like, um, but this is really, really important. So, so UNICEF is really cubically, it's like gray and gross, and it's got these like faded, like grape juicy cubicle walls and all this stuff. It, it makes it very difficult to work this way, especially with an innovation team who's scrappy, who's on the fly, who needs to talk to each other, and who really moves much more efficiently and rapidly when they're in, you know, can, when they don't have to be blocked by a wall. So we, we were asked many, many times to try to break those down rebuild and like create an open space for a team to make them more functional, more efficient, um, and, and essentially, you know, more happy and actually at the end of the day, like really good friends because of it. Um, we didn't have a lot of money. I mean, if we did, we would have like totally souped up the studio and made it look all like googly and all that stuff. But <laughs> we, we had a very small budget, but these are like some of the sketches that um, the design team's done over the years. We've done like four or five moves for the, um, for the innovation team. Um, and it's driven them quite nuts because we have to make them get up and stop their work for two seconds and move them around. And everybody always like fights about what's fair and if they get a window and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> But at the end, and we weren't like necessarily like, oh, it's all about open space, but it was, it was all about team dynamic. It was all about um, creating some type of, uh, what I realized at the end of the day, when you keep moving people around like that, um, we have, that team is built of scientists, developers, designers, communication folks, people from country off, you know, it, that are country office field experts, all those type of people, um, when you keep moving them around, what happens is you help build a level of equality, a level of team building that helps them kind of find camaraderie with each other and not say I'm better than someone else, I have the corner office, that kind of thing. With that, we were able to, with very little money, like scrappily put together this sort of open space. This is, this is still a mess, because when I left, I was just like, I'm done. I did my last open space build and like, Gotta go, you guys gotta clean up. 
But this has then allowed people to have a little bit more of a dynamic relationship with each other. And, and again, like I was just saying before, I think one of the biggest values is that this was probably the first team I've ever been on where I have some of, have, have some of my closest friends now because of this kind of stuff, because we've built relationships and because you have that trust and when you think about a friend, those are the people you go to to like do to, to disclose your hardest days and to like ask to help you solve the deepest problems that you're challenged with. And so those little nuanced things really actually have helped us just be a really great team, which I miss a lot, um, but they're doing fine. They're doing wonderful. And the last bit is my time, um, my very short time, but my very awesome time at the New York City um, Mayor's Office of Opportunity. Um, as of last Friday, we launched, we officially launched a service design studio that's embedded inside of the city. Um, this is like one of the nation's like first ever service design studios um, in government, and I'm really proud to be part of that. Um, we're a really tiny team still. Um, you can count us, we're less than one hands of people right now. And if you think about that against 8.5 million New Yorkers and 300,000 or so um, public servants, that's a very small team. But we, I have never been part of um, an organization that has, had, has given so much support to design and has just let us um, experiment has let us just has supported us and let us bring design and service design tactics and human centered design and all those techniques into into government and working with city employees some of the things that we are doing right now one of the things which you guys can check out now is that um, because we're so small we currently right now have like a website and binder, working binder with templates and case studies as, uh, as well as a small field guide which is really awesome that I, I carry around all the time. Actually, I don't carry it around right now because as of the launch someone stole it from me from the podium so I need to get a new one. But, um, but these things are helping us kind of scale the tactics and the tools and the principles that we have really um, worked with stakeholders and other design practitioners to build. So this is sort of the 101 um, for a lot of people in government who have never dealt with design before, but who actually have the inkling to like, and that interest to want to get, in, include that into their work. I think for many of you, like a tool, another toolkit, it's like kind of like, oh, well, what's so special about that? But I think within city, um, this is extremely important because it's, an un it's unfamiliar for that audience, right? For us, it's very, very familiar, right? We've seen toolkits, we've seen com you know, um, external agencies try to br bring those practices and these types of um, products into the field, but this one was built inside. Um, and on top of that, this one uh, is accompanied by an actual service design studio which is literally like a physical space where we actually have office hours for currently for government um, city employees. But we're all, once we figure out how to accommodate everybody, because we're actually we as of Friday uh, we announced it, but now we're like booked till the end of October almost, um, which is really great. Um, but we want to be able to invite pract uh, design practitioners as well as other. Um, agencies to come and um, talk to us about what their challenges are and see if we can um, really you know share our learnings and learn from them as well um, but we're at the same time um, really looking at how might we um, we're actually going to be doing a couple things one is like in January we're going to be doing an open open call for proposals within the city to be able to take on a full-on project from beginning to end and between all of that we'll be doing workshops and trainings um, with city employees um, to do everything from just 101s on HCD to you know just bringing in small pockets of services to teach them things like how to build a journey map, how to talk to people, um, how, to, how to prototype and what to think about that, or even if they're near an end of a product and about to deploy, what considerations do need to be made before that goes out into the public.
all of this to say that I think within the practice that I've been part of so far is that the studio, these toolkits, the way you build an office, the way you work with an individual, the way you work on a brand or a communication piece, when you're embedded, which I have been for four and a half years, there's a creative osmosis that happens. When a designer and when a team, a creative team is present inside an organization like UNICEF that's not used to that, or like the government that's not used to having creative weird people wearing dresses with chickens and chicks and eggs on them, um, it, it manifests somehow. And it manifests in little things like you having an innovation fund lead being able to like post it all their their like their whole strategy plan behind them or a you know a developer being able to really like map out what they want to do next with their product or some of your own apprentices who may not have practiced design before be thrown in deep on like trying to calibrate their eyeballs to picking pantone colors and learning mm -hmm. why that's so important to um, creating a consistent brand for your um, agency. But there's more that we need to do. These are just samples I just wanted to share with you today. And I'm going to just give you a couple resources if you want to learn more about UNICEF. The blog is amazing. It's like one, it's like New York Times and then this, you know. And then, um, and then actually UNICEF Design Nerds is the portfolio design website for the designers at UNICEF Innovation. It's, it's super awesome. One of the designers who like was all over that is in the house today. Um, but there's also a job opening for a senior designer with UNICEF uh, Innovation if you guys want to check that out. If you want to learn more about New York Center for Economic Opportunity, um, check out our service design website here. If anybody's interested, there's actually, I think, a design apprenticeship up right now live, but we have a GitHub website uh, which posts very regularly what apprenticeships are available with our team. So we have product and design, design folks that join our team, and it's paid, which is really awesome. And then the big thing is, um, as you know, uh, Hurricane Maria has really affected a lot of people. And there's a possibility that maybe our team will be pulled in to work in collaboration with the Office of Emergency Management very, very soon to support um, like evacuees coming in from Puerto Rico to New York. Not totally sure, but we are trying to gear up and prepare and collect a roster of designers who may be willing to work pro bono uh, here in New York. So if anybody's interested um, in joining that roster, I'm actually literally working on the criteria for the volunteers. But if you want to sign up here, I'd love to see your name there um, tonight or tomorrow morning, and we'll get back to you if anything happens. But if, if we don't do anything with Maria, we, we definitely are building this and prototyping this roster to really bring in um, New York City folks like yourself to be active. I think that's something that I feel is really great because a lot of times when you're not able to get to the field and travel and go out, um, and when you see a lot of people really helpless and money, giving money or you know, praying or hoping that the cans or food that you donated get somewhere is not enough. I think as a designer, um, that's probably maybe your most valuable thing that you might be able to offer right now or in any other circumstance. So if you'd like to sign up, that'd be great. Um, with that, I'm going to end with this quote from Bucky.